Hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming. There's so much energy in the room. Can we get a little bit of a round of applause for some more energy? Awesome. Thank you guys so much for coming to our Abbeyson showroom. We've done several events with Ivy and they've always been sold out, so exciting and so much fun as well as educational. So thank you so much for always partnering with us. Um, we're actually gonna start off our demo with Risa and then we'll get back into the panel. So thank you so much again for coming to the Abbeyson showroom. We actually have a designer trade program, which we can talk about a little bit later too, if you guys are interested in. Also, if you're taking any photos for social media, please make sure to tag Ivy as well as hashtag Abbeyson so we can repost you guys too. Thank you so much. And here's Risa. Thank you. And thank you to you and your team for having us here in this gorgeous space. We repetitively work with you guys because you're the best. And yes, I'm going to talk a little bit about Ivy, but I also do want to make sure that you talk to Lanny about her trade program because it's really awesome and they have great pricing for designers, quick ship program, no shipping, all the whole nine yards. She can hook you up, so definitely yes. make sure you talk to her. Thank awesome. you. Thank you. All right, so those of you, I see a lot of familiar faces, know about Ivy. Some of you might not know about Ivy, so I'm just going to chat really quickly. Um, Ivy is a community and business management tool. Some of you might have attended Laura's session. Laura Thurman spoke earlier today at 12 o'clock about tech tools. And there is a couple reasons why Ivy is the number one software and why we love Ivy. We keep developing new features. We want to hear from you. So we have this really amazing product clipper and it's one of our favorite features. We also just Launch, are launching a new iteration of our app so you can track your time on the go, you can generate tear sheets, there's a whole lot that you can do within Ivy to help you manage your business more efficiently and help make time for design, right? So, and Laura talked a little bit about our community earlier. We love having events like these. We love being at market. So do please make sure that you say hi to each other, that you introduce yourselves. If you're not already in our Facebook group, definitely please join. Um, as Nicole is showing us here right now, Ivy makes you look more professional, more efficient. Your clients, somebody once said to one of our Ivy designers, did you develop your own software? And she laughed, she'd only been in business for a year. So what's really nice about Ivy is it just gives you that overall professional feel. It's really intuitive, it's easy to use. You've got a dedicated account manager. So once you sign up to Ivy, and those of you who are already on Ivy and not using your dedicated account manager, please make sure that you come find one of us today and we'll get you hooked up with your dedicated account manager. All of that support's included. And we do have special pricing here today at Market. So definitely make sure that you talk to Nicole over here in her Ivy t-shirt and also our co-founder, is here as well so just that's a little bit about Ivy but without further ado I want to welcome my co-moderator co-moderator Liza Coors um, and Liza has a very extensive background we've worked really hard to put together a really great panel so Liza started her career in the home industry nearly 10 years ago, working for the International Home and Housewares Show, the largest US trade show for homewares held in Chicago. After relocating to California, Liza became the director of brand development for Design Campus. I'm sure some of you might know what Design Campus is, an online education platform and conference series for the interior design community. In her most recent role as the marketing manager at Barclay Butera, Liza was responsible for the company's digital brand development as well as overseeing marketing, social media, and events, which is how we met. Exactly. Her passion for home and expert knowledge in marketing led Liza to co-found Influence, an influencer marketing platform that connects social media influencers with home and design brands. Liza is a woman of many hats. She is also the contributor to California Home and Design Magazine, where she covers local events in Los Angeles and manages social media. So thank you so much for heading over here. <laughs> The point of today's session is really to give you content, give you new something new to learn. As you know, Ivy, every Wednesday we have online webinars, they're recorded. We want to help you take your business to the next level. So I really cherry picked different people that I've met along my journeys in the industry that are experts in what they do. Um, again, we really want to bring you industry pros that can speak on marketing, branding, designing, and other tools to maximize your overall business profitability. So, Next up, we have Christopher Kennedy. 
um, who we did a fun event with, and I've seen a lot in the past six months, and is really killing it in, with his business right now, and another man of many hats, Christopher. The golden state of mind describes Christopher Kennedy's philosophy towards interior design and life. Christopher creates interiors and products that are refreshingly exuberant, combining jet set nostalgia with California modernism. Christopher's work has been featured in Dwell, California Home and Design, California Homes, Trad Home, the LA Times, and numerous publications around the globe. Working from his retail shop in Palm Springs, if you are ever in Palm Springs, one of my favorite places, make sure you stop by. Christopher Kennedy has created his own furniture line, has artwork for Wendover, and pottery as well. He is the author of two books, California Home or California Modern and Making Mid-Century Modern, which I have at home. California Christopher spearheads the Christopher Kennedy Show House, which is in February during modernism, which raises approximately $100,000 for preservation scholarships and neighborhoods in and around Palm Springs. So please help me in welcoming Christopher to the stage. Well, I have the pleasure of introducing my co-founder, and Sage, also a woman of many, many hats. Yeah, come up here, come on. <laughs> a graduate of Stanford University. Where? And <laughs> Just there. And was a consumer strategist in Manhattan prior to becoming a full-time content creator, stylist, and designer. She started her blog, City Sage, in 2008 and still remains it today. Uh, in 2010, she co-founded the online lifestyle publication, Rue Magazine. Many of you guys yeah. might have heard of it. Okay. Woo! There's that. And that is that. And in 2016, she co-founded Light Lab, a creative studio and design firm in Los Angeles, and is also the author of an interiors book entitled Sage Living, which was published by Chronicle Books. And most recently, she joined the team at Influence, an online platform and agency where influencers, brands, and content creators collaborate in the world of design. Anne lives in LA with her husband and her four pets, yes, four, two dogs, two cats, and in, in, in LA, so small, you know, not big. 900 square yeah. feet and six beasts. Yes. <laughs> so welcome, Anne to the panel. And last but not least, another woman of like 10 hundred million hats. Um, and part of the reasons why we're actually here today, I was very fortunate to meet Jackie Von Tobel. Come on up here, Jackie. Um, big round of applause for Jackie. She's a hard woman to pin down too. So if you want her, you better book her in advance. She, um, I met her, Jackie in Vegas, in like two over two years ago and she ju and I just clicked and she does so many things it's gonna take me a while to read this but bear with me Jackie Von Tobel has an undeniable passion for design and the home furnishings industry she is an award-winning interior designer product designer and artist widely known as a trailblazing visionary expert mentor huge mentor and trendsetter Jackie is also a best-selling author of a home and decor resources book, including the Revered Industry Reference Guide, the Design Directory of Window Treatments. Pick her brain if you have a chance, because she's got a lot up there. She's passionate about design education and been teaching on a variety of design-related subjects for the years at the country's premier design trade shows and markets, and is a co-founder of the online resource for soft furnishing education and information, Soft Design Lab, and co-founder of the much lauded VIP Market Tour, which I know some of you have been on, for both Vegas and High Point Markets. In recent years, Jackie's award-winning lifestyle brand has expanded to include art, rugs, drapery, hardware, fabrics, tabletop, gift, garden, home, holiday, and more. You can find her work at places like Left Bank, which is where she's gonna be running to after this. But um, she is a woman who does so many things. It's hard to keep up with her. Definitely pick her brain after this session and give us a big round of applause for Jackie and all of our panelists.
What will we be covering today? Project management efficiencies, creating your personal brand, and industry trade secrets. So Christopher, I'm gonna be starting with you. There's a lot of lights in here, by the way. <laughs> yeah, maybe we can dim the lights up. Christopher, I feel like this has been a big year of learning and maximizing your overall profitability. Can you tell us what you have learned in terms of project management efficiencies over the last six months? Oh, I'm slow. Just a decorator from Palm Springs. Uh, just a small town guy. Uh, what have I learned in the last six months? Uh, documentation. So I think that I'm not super good at documenting. Um, as I think as creatives, we often just love to create and do our thing, and it's really all about execution and communication. And so we're really focusing on my firm, uh, on drawings, on on a finished schedule, it sounds really basic and I feel even dumb saying this, um, but like just really focusing on like documentation, I think it avoids all that stress. Like if you can have the finished schedule, if you can have, you know, CAD drawings that aren't really all that expensive, whether you have it in house or you outsource it, like just get that stuff done in advance and it'll avoid those texts at 7 a.m. from contractors asking you, you know, what's the grout on this tile? I mean, am I the only one who gets those texts? Is it just me? <laughs> Can, can tell, me, tell, me, like, tell me it's not just me, please. Oh, thank God. I, oh, my people are in this room. I'm so excited. Yay! I thought it was just me. Okay. Uh, so, yeah, just get that stuff dialed in in advance. And I think that as creatives, we normally love doing that. And also get paid. But we'll get to that in a minute. So, uh, That's actually what I was going to ask okay. you about. Christopher is so excited because now you're taking online payments. So tell me a little bit about that. Uh, yes, we're taking online payments. I will send you all the link. Uh, no. <laughs> He's taking online payments through Ivy, and he all of a sudden will screenshot and be like, oh my gosh, the money came into my bank account so fast. Right, because like, I live in Palm Springs, and the mail is like Pony Express. I can't even explain. Like, like if, it, if, like if a client sends a check from Los Angeles, it takes like 10 days to get to me. I don't even understand. So, and I avoided for years doing online payment. Um, well, because cash is king, and we love wire transfers and checks, you can't reverse them. But a lot of our clients now, I'm kind of all, I'm in this mindset of, we used to do like really large proposals and large amounts. And I'm like, you know what? Let's just set that IV uh, you know, payment request for one chandelier. I will sell that all day long. So yeah, I get paid really fast and it's kind of amazing. Um, yeah, so. Can you let us on, in on any other big secrets? And I'm probably jumping the gun here, but um, just turn it off when you're not talking. Thank you. Um, or else I'm going to echo. Thank you. <laughs> or maybe it's just me. I talk really loud. But in the last six months, you have learned a couple things that you've told me about. I don't know if we're ready to share this information yet. But in, we went to that event in OC, and we talked about billing and all of that kind of fun stuff. I just want to pinpoint just one piece of advice, besides like documentation, that kind of stuff, that we can give to the audience that they can take home, like project management fees or any changes in your billing structures that have helped you make more money. I'm already going there. It's yeah. literally the talk together. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so I raised my fees. Okay, since the last time I you were here. I advise you all. So I have um, this this like really amazing mentor, James Magney. Do you know who James Magney is? Yeah. Amazing designer products. And he taught me four years ago. He said, if your clients are not questioning your bills, you're not charging enough. <laughs> Can you all write that down? I mean, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not I'm not kidding. Like, write that down. If your clients are not questioning your bills, you're probably not charging enough. And he told me that five years ago. And so I just raised my fees and I added a 10% project management fee after being on a panel here at Amazon in April. And my clients didn't even like bat an eye. So raise your fees. And we'll get to that more later. Yes. Great. And I'm going to pass off to you. Okay. Great. Jackie, I'm going to switch this over to you. So, Jackie, we know you lead these amazing design tours um, and are interacting with designers all the time. And so what are some of the, the pain points that you're, you're hearing from designers? I know when I did Design Campus, uh, charging flat fees was a really hot topic. And so what are you hearing today and what advice can you, can you give us? Well, I think fee structure is always a, a hot topic. Um, yeah, for sure. And I mean, so that's kind of well right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, we're all struggling to basically reinvent the interior design career and the business model. So, I mean, that's kind of 
doesn't really need to be said. I think some of the really important things, though, that we find, um, one of the number one things is the lack of community um, for designers. And the fact that even if you belong to associations or what have you in your area, um, you know, you still want to be part of a larger community. And that's what we tried to form with our tours. Um, and basically, I mean, we called it early on, you know, building your design tribe. And it's one of the things that drew me to Ivy in the beginning um, was the fact that you guys got that. And I, I, I mean, that has been my mantra for years. It's one of the reasons why we started doing tours. And for those of you who don't know, we bring designers that have been, some ladies and gentlemen that have been in business for 30, 40 years have never come to market because there's a fear factor of it, you know. And I applaud all of you for being here. Um, and it's amazing now how the design community has come to market. But you feel now that you're part of a larger being, part of a larger community, and it empowers you as a business person. And so for that, yeah, I mean, that was one of the biggest things that they wanted to do and connect with people outside of just their own little bubble, their own little community. Because sometimes those are your competitors, right? That was not me. Sorry. Um, <laughs> So that's one thing. I think, you know, one of the other things, obviously, aside from billing, is sourcing products. And, you know, it's always a pain point. We live in a very fast-changing world right now. We've got a lot of online sales. We also have a lot of online design services coming up. Um, you know, the world, our world is changing really rapidly. How do you survive, um, you know, as a small design firm or even a large design firm when your clients can shop the product that you're trying to source here at market and they can find it online. Um, they can find it at a lower price sometimes or find knockoffs of that. You know, what's the answer to that? And, and quite honestly, we don't really know yet. We have some um, theories about it, but I, I think those are two of the really sort of hot topics that we hear about. So one, start billing more from Christopher. Two, join a community. And three, come to market, which you're all already doing. So you're one for three so far. You might be two for three, I don't know. But Christopher, and just to get in a little bit deeper on your favorite topic, billing, are you, will you tell us what you're charging, what you were charging, what you're charging now? And I know it changes by area, by location. Can I really put you on the hot seat? You did. So okay. I was here in April, and I said that I, my hourly rate is 175 an hour. And the audience like gasped and like it's like slapped me in the face. I'm like, you're like you're Christopher Kennedy. <laughs> like I don't really think about it. But I'm like, I just like like to do my job and like to serve my clients. And so I raised my fees to two twenty five an hour uh, after that panel and the audience slapping me in the face, like physically and metaphorically. And so we do bill hourly. But of course, when you bill hourly, what's the next question? How many hours is it gonna take? So, right, so we, is it just me? Am I the only one who gets that? Yeah. Okay, thank God, it's not just me. So they're like, well, how many hours is it gonna take? So now we estimate, and uh, because I was on a panel here at Evason, these amazing young women uh, from Philadelphia, uh, by Dell and Muschietti, said that their contract actually estimates the number of hours, and I love that, because I think your clients want to know how many hours it's gonna take, but the light bulb that went off for me, and to me, it's Jackie, it's about community. Like, we have to support each other. Like, if we can't all get together and share our secrets and our best and our worst and support each other, then why even be here? So I just think that there's enough to go around and that we have to help each other and share our contracts and share our secrets and share all of this. And so that's why I'm thrilled to be here and that you all are here. And so they said that they actually estimate the number of hours and it's in their contract, but it's get this was the light bulb. It was a minimum number of hours. Yes, write that down. So their contract sort of gives a range. What the range it gives is a minimum. And here was the next light bulb that said, if those number of hours haven't been met before installation, guess what they do? They bill the balance. I mean, I've only been doing this for like, you know, 15 years and I'm not a very fast learner, like I said earlier. So uh, that was the light bulb. So I actually changed my contract and I did that. And actually literally two weeks ago, we were about to install this project and I'm not very good. So how many of you are good at keeping track of your hours? Terrible. Terrible. And my staff is even worse. And so I have an amazing team, but they hate to write down their hours. But are they tracking their hours in the IV app now? They are working slowly. on it. Yeah. They are slowly, they're not very fast learners either, but they're slowly But also I email you, Christopher, tracking. and sometimes you don't respond to my emails, so 
So recently we were about to do an install, actually it was like, it was like last week, and we're about to do an install, and I was like, wait a minute, we haven't collected our fee balance. So literally, I like I send my clients an invoice through Ivy, and it was like eight thousand dollars. I mean, I'll take it, right? And it's like, oh hey, we've kind of forgot to build this, and the installation's coming up, and we did it. And so that was my takeaway, because we're all learning something every day. And so yeah, it's a minimum number of hours, and it is due before furniture installation. And my client was like, oh, that's a bargain, and he happily paid it. And then your other dreaded question, I'm sure, Jackie, you hear a lot about this on your tours, and you take designers that have never been to market into showrooms, and there's all different levels of pricing, but purchase fee. So some people don't charge a purchase fee. Some people charge, it's all over the board. So Chris, for any other takeaways from April to now we're in October, the last six months in purchase fee? I wanna hear Anne's purchase fee. I wanna hear what she does first. I don't know what that means. She just, you know, she's just like an influencer and like editors. <laughs> so, okay. Uh, okay, I'm gonna get on my soapbox right now. I would stand up if I could, but I can't. So, uh, can we stop as industry using the word markup? Can we just all agree right now to never say the word markup again? Can I get an amen? Yeah. It is not a markup. A markup makes it sound like you're charging it for no reason, like you're just making money willy-nilly for not doing anything. And I'm old guard, like I'm, I'm old now and I accept that. So I came from uh, these great designers like Steve Chase and Arthur Elrod who were charging 35%, but that was like in the 80s and the 70s when there was no internet and there was no this and designers were these great gatekeepers of this world of product and you could charge that. And so my former boss, who I was working for, for like, nine months before going out on my own, and to say I didn't know what I didn't know would be a vast understatement. Um, and 15 years later, I'm still figuring it out, thanks to Risa and friends like Jackie and uh, Anne. But so, you know, to charge, you know, 35% on a Holly Hunt dining chair is a great living. But most of us are not selling Holly Hunt dining chairs, are we? And so you cannot charge 35% on Avison or other great brands at market, it's ridiculous. And your client is, what are they doing? They're questioning you. Wait, why are you making 35%? Well, okay, this Avison sofa, which is lovely, if, it's, if you buy for $300 and it's MSRP 1,000, but it's online all day long, I'm going there, it's okay. I'm just, I'm just totally going there, okay. Okay, so if it is online for $850, why are you selling it for less? You should not. Your, your client's going to buy that product somewhere. They're gonna buy that Arterior's lamp from Paragold or House or wherever. They're gonna buy that lamp. And why shouldn't they buy it from you? And why should they buy it for less through you than they're going to buy it for online? So I think that we have to eliminate the word markup and make the money because they're going to buy that product. And so I've actually switched to selling it for the online price and adding 10%, and we'll talk about that in a hot second. But yes, stop using the word markup because it's ridiculous. And once you say, I'm going to sell it, by the way, the MSRP on that lamp is 950. It's online all day long at 825, and they're gonna buy, it. let's just, and okay, I, I beat it. So I would say, okay, if that lamp is online for 825, then sell it for 815. But you're still making like 150% and your client's thanking you for charging less than they can find it for online. But you shouldn't sell that lamp, that MSRP is for 950, that's on house for 825. You shouldn't sell it for 450. That's absurd. I'm sorry, it is absurd. Yes. And so that's why I think we are as an industry, we have to stop using the word markup and start selling things for what they cost, for what they cost online. And your client's gonna go from, and say, like, why are you adding 35%? I'm not, I'm charging you what this product sells for. Or maybe 10 bucks less, and then they're thanking you. Yeah. So now that I know what you're talking about and what that means. <laughs> Um, I can tell you something I do Please. that's similar, and, and this is where the influencer piece comes into things. And you're I want to preface that. it by saying you're all influencers, because if you are working in a service industry and you're making recommendations to clients, that's influencing them, that, that's influencing their taste, that's influencing their decisions. You are all 
influencers. So just putting that one out there. But so what I'll do is I'll call up Abison or Paragold or whoever, and I'll say, I'm working on a powder room. It's gonna be gorgeous. These are the lamps the client wants. Send them to me. I'll do an Instagram of these lamps with a dedicated branded tag of Paragold or Abison or whoever, wherever I got the lamps from. So I'm getting the lamps as a product trade from the company. So the, the and they're getting the coverage and they're getting an image to use on their social media, which is, super expensive. which is it's super expensive and valuable. And then I'm turning around and selling them to the client. Um, Loving all of that. <laughs> let me, whoa. Let me go back to. Who's on? I'm off. I'm off. Okay. So, it's my, I think it's my bling. It might be your bling. <laughs> I already whipped my coat off. I might as well whip off my jewels. Okay, is that better? I want to go back to the purchasing fee. Okay. It's not a market. At the very worst, it's a purchasing fee. No, no, no. But market and purchasing fee are very different. They're two different things. When you are here at market, you are probably going out and you are looking for product for your client. You are charging your client, hopefully, for that as a purchasing fee. That's part of it. It's part of your hourly structure. If, I think it's your ring. Too close. Good. It's your ring. I'm really making it strip down. Sorry, I love you. My space. She keeps yeah. telling her that. <laughs> 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 life of the party. Ooh. Oh no, that will clear the room, my darling. <laughs> In any case. Bringing, bringing designers to market is sort of our purvey. And when you come to market, number one, you're researching what market to come to for the best value for your clients. You are spending your money from your business to come and get a hotel room, to pay for your airfare to come to market, to um, go through hours and hours of research in all of these different showrooms until you find that very perfect reclining chair that isn't hideous and looks great in your living room from Amazon Living, right? Um, and so that is something of value, and that's something of value that you need to charge your clients for. So whether you're charging a flat fee, whether you're charging um, hourly fee, every product that you pick out for that person has a price, and it costs you money to pick that out, but then it also costs you an hourly price to purchase that item. You have to fill out a purchase order, right? You have to communicate with the company. You have to track that order. You have to take care of anything that comes up um, in the midst of that order, whether it's back ordered, um, whether it's coming in late. All of those things, those aren't freebies, folks, okay? It isn't just something that we do. Um, it's not community service, it is a service service, and you should be paying for that, and that is a purchase fee. And it should be added on, and especially if you're coming to market specifically working on a project, you should tell your clients, okay, these are the items that I'm looking for, and you should charge them shopping time while you're here. So there, we are the only retail-based industry in the world that doesn't have any standardization uh, of yeah. how we charge, how we price, what is of value, what is not of value. And you know we need to band together and stand up for ourselves. We are not community beautification, you know, club. <laughs> you know, this isn't our hobby. You know, we don't like to just make people smile with a happy room. It's a profession. We work very hard at it, um, and we need to stand up for ourselves. I agree. Like I would say, like if we could do what the realtors did, and all get together and say we're going to charge six percent, and no one questions it. Yeah. They all got together, that's what we charge. And often they're making more on a project than we are, aren't they? Yeah. And we're in there in and out. I mean, I'm not saying the realtors don't work hard because God bless them, they do. But we're there, you know, they're there for three months and we're there for a year. And yet we're making less than they are and no one questions their fees. And where's the fear factor? Sorry, where's the fear factor for them? Are they afraid to charge their clients? Heck no, has your, your realtor ever said to you, I'm really sorry. You know, I hate to really charge you for this, but I mean, I did work really hard on it, and I think I deserve something. You know, they slam that contract down. Yeah. You know, you don't go to Whole Foods and haggle over the wholesale price they paid for the tomato. 
Um, you know, what did you, what's the whole price that you paid for this? Well, I don't feel that I should pay your markup. I think I should pay, well, maybe 10%, it's worth 10%. The avocado is worth more, it looks better. You know, I mean, we're the only industry that doesn't get it. Um, you know, who else says their markup? Nobody. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. We need to cut it out. We see a lot of this in our Facebook group too. Um, and I think that this is the time where we need to just cut it, like Jackie said, and figure amongst each other, really take that next step in our business. So this is what we're charging. This is what our worth and really value our time. And I get so many designers that text me all the time and I'm mean. If you text me, I'm going to say, wait, what are you charging? No. And I followed up with Christopher actually like three times to be like, did you raise your rates yet? Did you raise your rates yet? And I don't, I don't mess around. I won't, I won't curse on the mic today, but I don't, but yes. So the other question that I want to talk about, and we have so many more other topics to get into, I just wanted to give you the kind of nitty gritty power through and get all of the good information we could out of the panelists. And you better be taking notes because uh, there's going to be pop quiz at the end. Um, but hiring, for all of you guys, hiring can be a challenging investment for a designer, but can be incredibly beneficial if you know, you know what to outsource and for the growth of your company. Have you grown, we can start with Christopher, your team over the years, and how has it helped your business? Oh, just that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, no, so we have a, I mean, my team is about six people, um, and uh, it's wonderful. Uh, we're actually, we're recently, we're now kind of focusing on, like, like I said, on documentation. So what I'm hiring right now is actually AutoCAD. I mean, I went, I mean, I went to, to, to uh, School for Architecture, but I'm not a very fast learner, like I said, so I've not been doing that for 15 years. Uh, so actually what I'm hiring right now is not so much more designers. We're hiring you know, young people that sort of know the software, know the technology, and can do the documentation and really help execute our vision. And I think if I had to go back again and like, I mean, I'm very blessed, and I, my, my firm is doing really well, but if I had to say, what, 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 would my, what would my first employee be, if I was gonna kind of go back in time and give myself, my younger self advice, I think my first employee would be like an office manager, um, and ordering and execution, all of that, and my second hire would be AutoCAD. Got it, Got it. and would you hire that AutoCAD person full-time, or maybe outsource? I, I think a takeaway for this audience, I think that you, you don't, yeah, you can totally outsource that. So I don't think you need to take on the expense. Employees are super expensive. Write that down too. So, I, and I'm in California, where people don't realize that, like, you know, the, the taxes and like, and like whatever hell's out of, uh, or like whatever taxes are taken out of the employee's paycheck, we pay that times two. So, employees are expensive, and you can outsource that. You can really grow your firm and look super professional, but you don't have to take on all of that overhead. So, you can find someone to do AutoCAD for you probably for 50 bucks an hour, and you can charge 75 to 100. So what I've also kind of learned the last six months is when I've been too busy and wanted to, to say no to projects or clients, actually, that's dumb because I can actually hire someone to do it at a lesser rate and charge more. So you can really find something. You can go on Facebook. You can go on the Ivy website. And you can really look like a big professional firm by outsourcing. You can outsource social media. You can outsource AutoCAD. You can even outsource purchasing. And it actually can be a profit center. So I kind of had a light bulb go off. Like, why am I turning down work? Or why am, why am I sitting up at night doing hand drawings? Because I can, but doesn't mean I should. And I've actually hired AutoCAD, actually outsourced it. And he charged me 50 bucks an hour. And I charged the client you know, 75 or even like 125. So you can actually make money and serve your clients. So your six steps, you should write that down. And hopefully some of you are doing that. I know some of the, you in the audience are already outsourcing, but as Christopher said, can be a huge profit center. What about you, Anne? Because you have so many things going on. Um, yeah, so one thing I just want to say about hiring and outsourcing is for me, it was an act of getting over myself and letting go of my ego and letting go of my belief that if it's gonna be done right, it needs to be done by me. Because frankly, that's BS, and it's, it was holding me back. And you know, sometimes still does, because I'm a work in progress. But what I, did, what I did in building a team was really looking at the areas that were my biggest time sucks that someone else also could be doing, sort of like what Christopher was saying. And for me, a big one is just inbox management. 
don't get me wrong, I love to sit down for three hours and write beautiful, wordy emails that you know express how smart and talented I am, but should I be doing that? Absolutely not. So I have a virtual assistant who lives in Florida and she charges me $30 an hour and we have like a monthly flat fee and every day at around two o'clock we just hop on the phone and she's like, okay, what do you want me to say to this one? What do you want me to say to this one? And I haven't been behind on my inbox since. It's amazing when I'm wait, traveling. Wait, 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 wait. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Get Christopher this ASAP because he ignores all of my emails. Yeah. I'm gonna hire him for you. Game her. changer. Game changer. And if I'm driving in the car, I can also be responding to emails. And I live in LA, which means I'm always driving in the car, right? So, and that was another thing, like I was thinking, I, I have to so be, much. right, I was thinking I have to be the one to do this, but then the, the end result was that I was never doing it anyway. <laughs> So that's one, but then so wait, also- So how did you find this person and what's the website like? Her name, her name is Jenny Lyons and she's wonderful. She's great, she's gonna get an influx of clients and she's gonna love me for it. But yeah, Jenny Lyons, Jenny Lyons and she's a virtual assistant, she's fantastic. She does other things like she'll run your social media, she'll run your Pinterest, she'll, she's a great business consultant, she's super smart and she just wants to like help people and have her own business and live her life. She's great. So that's that's one thing that there, I would say. There's also a company out there called Upwork, yeah. and they're really, really great for Upwork. Upwork, yes. And you can get virtual assistants, graphic design help, and you can really put your exact needs. I know I've used them for a lot of things, and they're you know a startup platform that you can really use and find a lot of help to support you. And, and then the other one is, I just have a really wonderful family friend. He's 26, he's an, a, like an aspiring actor, and he has a super flexible schedule, and so I'll just call him on a Monday and be like, I'm doing an install on Wednesday, uh, do you have a few hours in the afternoon? And sometimes he's just doing things like returning stuff to stores, or, but what I think what it, what, what I'm getting at is don't be attached to the idea of like hiring an employee. Identify your needs, identify who can meet them, and make it happen. Fini. <laughs> Whoops, I'm late. I'm never emailing again, thank you. I think I'm radioactive, I live in Las Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> I have two things. First of all, I run a completely virtual business. I am a, uh, learned a great, I'm losing my jewels now, sorry. Um, I learned a really great lesson from a publicist that I had. Um, when I hired her, I looked at her website, and it was fantastic. She had offices in Tokyo, and New York, and London, and LA, and Las Vegas. And, um, you know, and these people and their bios were amazing. I mean, they looked really legit and everything. They obviously knew what they were doing, all of her people that she had. And when I got to know her, I realized that she outsourced all of that work. But there was nothing um, untruthful about it. They were her employees. They worked virtually with her. And I also use Upwork a ton. I'm a, an artist and I do a lot of graphic work and half my people are in the Philippines, half of them are in, in um, you know, Asia. They do amazing work for pennies, pennies on the dollar. And you can work with the same person over and over again. So I totally encourage you to um, look into those sites, but then don't also don't forget to look within your peer group. Um, you, I, I know for some reason, weird reason, a lot of accountants or nurses then become designers later in life and they have valuable skills, especially the accountants, that you can trade off with. You may have a skill that another designer needs. Maybe you're great at drawing. Um, another designer friend of yours is not. You can trade off skills. Maybe she's great at bookkeeping. So, you know, it's part of that community building and living within a community of professionals where you can trade off. Um, the second thing is interns. How many of you have had an intern? Okay, an intern can either be a blessing or a nightmare, right? <laughs> But you, it's because of where you're getting your interns from. You know, you want either third or fourth year student interns that are going for a legit degree from a legit school, and you want to pay your interns. We all want a free intern, right? You don't necessarily, according to your state, have to pay an intern minimum wage, and you don't have to take out taxes. You can pay them as an independent contractor. You must check with your state and make sure that that applies, but in most cases it does. Um, and so you can pay them $10 an hour. Um, they 
are much more likely to do a good job for you if they're getting paid. They're much more likely to show up. And I have had many interns that have turned into full-time employees for me and have been with me for years. And so, I mean, that is something, if you're a one-man shop and you can't afford somebody to do a lot of that, you know, work, try it out. You know, the worst thing is it don't work out and they go away, right? So I would encourage you to do that. Okay, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit. Hello. And talk about branding. Super, super important. Okay, so each of you have a very defined brand present presence. Christopher, I consider you like the king of mid-century design, for sure. Okay. <laughs> uh, Anne, very minimalist, Scandinavian, modern design aesthetic. Um, Jackie, I believe on your website you have um, your tagline, colorful, classy, cool. So tell me a little bit about how you got to understanding that voice. Was it your personal design aesthetic? Is it projects that you've maybe worked on that has evolved? Um, yeah, tell us about that, that evolution. If you want to start, Anne, I'll start with you. Sure, I can start. Um, well, I think the, the, the word you use, the key word, is evolution. Uh, because if you look even at things I was doing a year ago, they look very different. And the fun thing about social media is you can scroll back and see that evolution. And, and for me, a big part of it is where I live. Like when I lived in San Francisco, my aesthetic was very different than it is now in LA. When I lived in New York, it was completely different. I was also younger, right? So it's really just a culmination of where I live. What types of influences and inspirations I'm seeing. Like lately I'm obsessed with um, Australian design and so I'm really incorporating that into what I'm doing. Um, I'm obsessed with natural sunlight and we have so much of that in Southern California and that really inspires me. So again, it goes back to just not being attached. It's one of my, I'm very zen, right? I'm, um, it's one of my favorite sayings because it leaves room for growth and expansion and not thinking I'm one way or the other, but rather just being on a journey and being open to all the bountiful inspiration that is available to me. And then having my personality, which is its own unique being, right? And that's the filter that everything gets run through. And so, personal style. And my personal style and my voice, like my, you know, I've always had a sardonic sense of humor, and I've always loved big words like sardonic. So, <laughs> right? <laughs> what does sardonic mean? It means wry. Does everybody know what wry means? <laughs> like a little bit, a little snarky and self-deprecating, and, and kind of like... We know. We know. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so, so, but what I think... But the, the message, the take home message is trust that the way you see the world is more than good enough. That the way you see the world is obviously 100% unique because you are unique and that no one else sees it the same and you don't have to adjust it for anyone, you don't have to change it for anyone. Just do what you love and what excites you. Just do you. Do you. <laughs> Christopher, how about you? Um, I'm just like running how you see the world is good enough. I'm already, I'm trying to like mentally write that down. Okay. Um, that's amazing. What was the question? <laughs> I'm still taking in what Anne said, and I'm. How did you find how your did I find yeah, your evolution of your design aesthetic? You know, when you want to launch a brand, I know that a lot of people do. It's actually a double-edged sword. So I'll just go there if that's okay. So. When, you know, I never thought of myself as mid-century. I've been modern since I was in school for architecture. I, I just loved modern design back in my 20s. And I went to Europe to study the Bauhaus and the modern master. So I guess it was fate that I found my way to Palm Springs. And, you know, 15 years ago when everything was Italian and Tuscan, I was doing contemporary. And it wasn't very popular. And I never got hired for those big McMansions in Orange County. And... I lost out on all of that. But you know, as they say, to thine own self be true. And I guess 15 years later, I'm glad the world is catching up and things are going more contemporary. And I still like to think of myself as just sort of contemporary luxury. And I cringe a little bit, even though Liza said it, like I'd been pigeonholed mid-century. But when you want to launch a brand or a product or a look, you kind of have to decide what that look is, right? And I think that a lot of us as designers pride ourselves on being able to execute 
our client's personality with our good taste put upon it, of course, and spun it. But when you really want to launch a brand or write a book or your product line, you really have to decide what your look is. And actually, it's a bit of a double-edged sword because then suddenly your potential clients maybe aren't hiring you because they think of you as this singular look. So actually, when I launched a brand, it was a bit, I'm just warning you because I know you guys maybe want to do it. I actually kind of, my client roster uh, dropped a bit in the beginning because suddenly I was, you know, Mr. Mid-Century. And so I kind of lost it on design jobs. I'm doing fine, thank you, don't, don't worry about me. But like, you know, it, it was, it took a while, like it was really a decided effort, like we're gonna make this brand, but the phone calls kind of stopped a bit for the design business, and it kind of is coming back now, which is great. But it is kind of, it is, you have to look at yourself and decide what you're doing, and that's what Jackie's done it, and has done it, because clients are gonna call you for a certain thing, and so your potential client roster might get a bit smaller. Um, that was my long answer that I don't know if I said anything. No, but it, uh, it, was, it, was but it is, it, it's sort of a, yeah, it's a double edged sword. Yeah. Okay, try not to break. <laughs> okay, I mean, I have a couple of really strong thoughts on this because I've gone through this several times in my career and it's a really hard exercise to do. And if you ever get the chance to listen to Timothy Corrigan, a great designer, talk about branding, because he came from the advertising world, do not miss out on that because he is the absolute master. And what he will tell you is branding is more about an emotion than it is about a specific look yes. or about a specific attribute that you possess um, because you want it to last your lifetime. Right. And you are going to change. I mean, things that I did 20 years ago when I was in the Tuscan McMansions, up to my eyes in faux finishing and patina. <laughs> um, I'm certainly not that now. Um, so I had to reach in very deeply, and there's a lot of really good online um, exercises that you can do on defining your brand. Um, because I've taught or learned, listened to a lot of talks, and it's mostly people talking about, well, what do you sell, and who is your ideal client? To me, it's about emotion. And so what I had to boil mine down was colorful, classic, and cool. Colorful, because I use color. I live color, I dress in color, and everything that I do is infused with color because I am a more artistic side, on the artistic side of the biz with product design. Um, classic, because I use classical elements, and that is my passion. You know, I love history, I love things that are old, and I like to breathe new life into them. And cool, because I, I dedicate myself to learning about trends and staying current. And for me, those three words express the emotions of that, right. um, what I was doing. And so it's very hard and you constantly question it. And like with, with your mid-century modern, I too saw some clients like, what, is, what does that mean? You know, what is it? And if people get it, they get it. But I mean, I think it's more about emotion. And be sure if you hear Timothy Corrigan, and I think somewhere, yeah, you can find it probably online on YouTube, one of his um, things for like design bloggers or something, but look it up, because he is the master. Yeah, he's the master. Actually, he talked about Timothy Corrigan, C-O-R-R-I-G-A-N. Uh, he's one of the top 180 designers, probably in the top 10 um, in the United States, and uh, he was a master advertising executive and oh yes I mean he was like jetting all over to you know Switzerland and everywhere and that's how he built his clientele but um, no he's an amazing guy yes. you know what he, what, what he taught me is if you have a dark room so Timothy taught me if you have a dark room like like what Wallace wanted to we want to paint it mm -hmm. white this is actually if you have a, a dark room paint it yellow or add yellow to the room because that will make it ah. sunnier and then from the master to the program, and it works. And one, one other thing, even if you're just starting out, you need a brand. You don't need to want to get into product design or need to grow whatever. You need a brand, just as a business. So it's an important thing to start working on in your career. So talking a little bit more about that, so within all of your branding platforms, there's you know websites, blogs, social media, newsletters, all of the printed collateral. Um, how, how do you keep it all consistent and why is that so important to all of your individual brand presence? 
Jan, do you want to start? <laughs> all right, consistency. Well, I think it starts with something we probably all have, which is perfectionism. Like, you don't get into this business if you're not an absolute anal retentive, like, hardcore details person, right? So, congratulations, everyone's off to a good start for consistency. But um, self-editing is really, really, really important. So, recognizing, I might love this, but is it consistent with the message that I've decided I'm going to send? No? Okay, then it's not something I share. And so... That, you know, I'm talking about blog, Instagram, more like on this public facing brand side. Maybe there's a client project that's really beautiful and terrific, but is it what you've decided you're going to be in the design community? Perhaps not, and so that might not be one you play up as much. It was great for making some money, but it's not gonna be the one that you're pitching out to magazines, for example. Um, and then also, not being afraid to delete things and change things. Again, going back to just getting over myself. I'm not the be all and end all, and the thing that I put up on Instagram three weeks ago is not like, you know, written in stone. If I look back on it and it's not something that I'm proud of, nobody's gonna like burn my house down if I delete it. It's gonna be okay. Um, and, and I was actually, I've, I've been surprised at how many people I've spoken to, and I'm thinking of a particular incident. Really dear friend of mine, incredibly talented interior designer. Her website sucks. I mean, it's so bad. And I thought I was doing her this huge favor by saying, let's go out for coffee and we can like brainstorm updating your website. And she looks at me so offended. She's like, I had a professional do that. And I, it, clearly it wasn't a message she was open to hearing, but it makes me really sad because she's done some really incredible work and her website doesn't speak to it at all. And so the message there is that feedback's not personal, it's just feedback. And you can take it in, receive it for what it is. If it lands for you, great, do something about it. And if it doesn't land for you, like in one ear, out the other, fine, whatever. But making it personal is the worst thing you can do because then you're not open to growing and changing and adapting. Um, I would say on, on branding, um, in the last five years, things have changed so dramatically. Uh, we used to be invisible personally, but our business brand stood out. Now there is no line between that. You are your brand, you live your brand, you walk your brand every day. On social media, if you have a blog, if you have a website, consistency in your work not only matters, but consistency in yourself. Um, we have the queen of personal branding in the back of the room, Kelly Ellis. Um, <laughs> there's no one better at, who has done a better job of branding both her personal brand and her work brand and melding those together. It's seamless. When you see her, you know exactly what she does. You know what she stands for. You know what her work's going to look like. And that's important, you know. And I have emulated my friends in the industry in trying to do that, you know, my stuff is feminine, it's floral, um, and you know, whether I want it or not, I'm wearing a print and a color, and I keep the same hairstyle and the same everything. And it's important for us now to represent both personally and, you know, in your work. And it's important to show yourself in your work. That's one thing that I will say about branding on people's websites and in blogs, is they tend to show pictures of their work and then all these pictures of themselves. Show yourselves at work. Show yourselves doing what you do. Show yourselves in spaces that you've done and with happy clients. That will sell more for you than 50 selfies of yourself at a party or um, you know, in, even in front of something. People want to see you doing what you do best. That's my advice. So let's talk a little bit about social media, one of my favorite categories. So I want to learn about each of your social media strategies just because you have such distinct businesses um, and you as an influencer, Christopher, interior designer, Jackie, product designer, artist, how do you use social media for all of your businesses? So I'm kind of old guard and so, well I, I used to, a few years ago I actually hired someone because these, these companies would email you or call me every day you know, can we run your social media? And I hired someone for a short time. And then they were like calling me, you know, like on the 25th of each month and said, oh, we need to plan these next 10 
whatever posts. And I'm like, um, that's great, but the time it takes me to plan them with them, I could just do it myself. So not that there aren't great companies who can do your social media, and if that's right, then you should do it. But for me, I think that it, it has to be myself and my voice, and I actually like writing. I'm a published author, if you didn't know. So I actually, that's actually well, that's part of like, it's part of me like living authentically and I like writing and as a designer we don't get to write all that much so I actually like to do that. So for me social media, it is myself, it is my voice, we run it authentically but that said, I'm not really very good like on Instagram for me, I'm not really good at like the impromptu photo, I'm kind of a perfectionist as Dan talked about so I like to sort of use our really beautiful professional photography and I think that maybe is a downside to what I do because I think that I, you know, like when I publish like a really beautiful portfolio shot, it gets a lot of likes but when I publish what I'm installing that day, I get even more likes and so I'm trying to get over myself um, and publish the impromptu stuff and I'm not very good at it. Uh, but I actually think Instagram stories has changed everyone's life. And so what stories lets you do is, pr is promote those things that maybe aren't the beautiful finished product. Uh, it's, yeah, it's the behind the scenes. And then I kind of save my feed for like the beautiful epic photographs. I'm sure that's not like revelations to any of you, but you know, I'm a slow learner, like I said. So uh, that's kind of how, so I use Instagram. And I think that you just have to choose a platform. There are so many, you can't do all of them. So I think Instagram is the new blog. Um, there's great bloggers out there and they do very well and Anna does very well, but if you don't have the time to do a blog right, then just don't do it. Use Instagram as your blog. And personally, I think Facebook cause should kind of be saved for personal matters, perhaps not political, but I sort of think that Facebook is great for keeping up with personal relationships and Instagram's great for business relationships. And there's a lot of great designers who are doing amazing things on Instagram. Like my friend Sean Smith, um, like he does an amazing job kind of showing what he's installing that day. And I think that people are really getting clients off Instagram and find the way to do that. Yeah, um, so basically you said everything that I would have said, but I'll, I'll change the wording a little to, and and use the phrasing that I speak to if I'm talking to consulting clients. So social media is a tool, just like anything else you use in your business. And like any other tools, you wouldn't pick up a wrench and try and hang a picture. So social media is about understanding the strengths and capabilities of each platform. Instagram feed has different strengths and capabilities than Instagram stories, than Pinterest, than, than all of the others, right? And so understanding what each one does, how people consume each one, and then also um, finding the ones that you like best that you have fun with, because frankly, the most important thing is that you're excited and enjoying it. And obviously, it can be a slog even for someone like me, but the most important thing is that the energy you're coming into it with is a positive one because that's gonna be transmitted to the audience. If you've got a really exciting insult day and you're super jazzed, then that's the day to pick up your phone and put it on stories and just get people really excited. Maybe that's not a day you post a really beautiful shot on your feed. But then maybe you do have that beautiful finished product and you're super excited about that. So you put that up on your feed and that's a day you don't worry about stories because you have a cold and you know, like your dog is pooping on the rug or whatever, right? It's not a panel if I don't bring up poop. But, um, <laughs> but so the point, the point that I'm trying to make is just seeing them as tools for different things and maximizing them depending on where your head's at, what your goals are. Um, I agree absolutely with everything. I think pick your poison, right? I mean, you, you've got to figure out what is the right platform for you. It's impossible to do everything. Um, you're not a commercial designer and a residential designer and a hospitality designer and you know a medical facility designer. You've picked one thing. You also need to find out and figure out really who are you gonna market to with your social media. I think one of the big problems we have in our industry is we're marketing to one another and not to customers. It's the snake eating its own tail, right? We're a very kind of cannibalistic industry. So we're posting ourselves at events and at trade shows and things like that, and you see us, you know, boasting of our achievements or what have you, or showing our projects to one another, but is that really gonna get you a gig? You know, you need to showcase your work to buying customers, so how do you do that? Um, you know, and that should be your goal for 90% of the designers 
that are trying to get actual buying customers through that. And so think about what you're posting uh, when you're doing that. If you're just partying all the time and having a great time, or your client's like, when are they doing my work? Wait, they told me they couldn't make my install on Friday afternoon, and here they are boozing it up, you know, at some design party. Well, so, oh no. no. <laughs> But so really know who your target is, you know, and what is your goal for your social media. For a lot of people, the effort that goes into all of that may not even be the return that you want or won't give you the return that you want. We feel a lot of pressure to play that game and to be, um, you know, have the numbers. And as a product designer, I felt it 10 times over, and I'm sure you guys have. Manufacturers won't even look at you unless you reach a certain level, you know, and I just decided to kind of ignore that I have worked really hard on my social media, but it's not a huge priority for me um, Because I don't feel that the people that I want to connect with are really seeing me on there I would rather approach them in different ways. So number one pick your target figure out what your goals are and then apply it properly to re achieve that goal Okay, and as we're wrapping up, I have a couple last questions for you guys, and then we'll shoot it over to you guys for some Q&A, and then we'll have some food and drink and fun. But um, really quickly, Christopher, in your opinion, because you've been in the industry for so long, over 15 years. Probably old. <laughs> no, because you're still less young, and you're still young at heart. How has technology changed the way that you manage your business for the better? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a tool, definitely, and kind of learning to adapt to those tools as an old guy. Like me, like, oh, let's take online payments and get paid immediately is like t totally changed uh, my life. And there are so many tools like Ann just taught us today about, oh, you can have a virtual assistant to answer your email. Um, mind blown, not gonna <laughs> lie to you. Uh, so, yeah, I think just finding those tools, realizing that you can use them uh, to help your business and uh, to make your life easier and, and to make more money while serving your clients in a better way way it's it's incredible so embrace those things learn and then just call your friends and let them help you and support each other as a community and share our secrets that's i think the best tool of all and Anne, what about you <laughs> could you repeat the question <laughs> of course in your opinion how has technology changed the way you manage your business yeah i mean my business has only ever existed with that with technology. It's the foundation of it. It it didn't exist. The industry did not exist when I started blogging, right? Like 10 years ago, people were like, what's a blog? Is that a fad, right? Um, but here's what I will say, that technology has influenced me in as much as it's gotten, it's forced me to be comfortable with how uncomfortable constant change is for me. And what I mean by that is that 10 years ago, this industry looked nothing like it looked now. I mean, this industry looks nothing like it looked two years ago, right? And so getting comfortable with the idea that it's always gonna be changing and I'm always gonna, you know, that it's actually a blessing to be someone who's excited about the idea of seeing what's next, being ahead of the curve, um, being a, a leader. And just as we are all influencers, we are all leaders in our lives, right? Um, and so, but having technology kind of be the thing that like kicked me in the butt to get comfortable with change, or rather comfortable with being uncomfortable, because I'm never gonna be comfortable with, with how fast things change and how exhausting it can feel to keep up, but just accepting the idea that, hey, that's the way that it is, and I can either resist it or just like jump in and go with it. So thanks, technology. <laughs> Um, I use technology like my Wonder Woman cape, okay? It takes a, a average woman and turns me into a superhero. So I can take my medium level artistic skills, I can put my work into Photoshop, I can enhance it, I can change it, I can turn it into, you know, what I, the, the best possible thing that I can produce. Um, there's no way that I can create what I, can do by hand manually. For designers, CAD, 3D rendering, um, mood boards, all of that stuff, it's your superpower as a designer. 
you know, you can envision that, but now we have these great tools where we can put it visually in front of our clients yeah. in more and more evolving and exciting ways. And technology is what sets us apart from decorettes and personal shoppers. And it used to be hand skills. I am a super big component or proponent of hand rendering and hand skills, but in, used in combination with each other, you're unbeatable. And so technology just takes us to a whole nother level. And that is really the foundation of our industry now. You you're a superhero. Um, I just want to add one thing. The most important thing that technology has done for me is enabled me to create community and find my people. When I started blogging, my mom was like, I'm so afraid you're just going to be behind a computer all day, all alone. And I am an introvert. I am, and I'll like curl up and never leave the house. But then technology has allowed me to find my people, get the small talk out of the way, so that when we meet in person, it's like, yes, we already know we love each other, let's just hug, and like, and that is so fun, and I leave places like this, which I never would have been at it in the first place if it weren't for technology, feeling invigorated, inspired, and so impassioned by what we're all up to. So that's the real gift of technology. We love that. Thank you for saying that. And I'm going to turn it around to you guys for a couple questions. And then I know you're antsy to get up and get some food and drink. And like Anne said, introduce yourself to somebody next to you. That's what this is all about at the end of the day. We really want to help you take your business to the next level. Whether you're using Ivy or not, you're all part of our tribe. And we definitely want to make sure you know, you can learn. And hopefully you took notes, because I'm telling you, I'm going to send out a pop quiz with a special yeah. surprise at the end. Um, and if you do have any other questions about Ivy, come find myself or Nicole or Lee. We'll be in the back of the showroom where all the food and drink is. So any questions? I think we have, yeah. Uh, I could just say a little bit about my question. Just oh, things. yeah. Well, I'll take you aside. I just want to get everybody out of their seats and I can tell you more about Ivy. Nicole can grab you right after this. Yes. Do we share our product fee with our clients? I have contracts in all different ways of doing it. Um, my favorite is actually, it's not specified. Like, you know, we're going to give you a proposal that tells you the price of something and you can say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Like. That's how, like, you know, restaurant menus work. You, the table, like, you can choose to buy this or not. But that said, I will call it if I say,